the depths of Congo rainforest in Africa have enclosed inside them some of the little known wetland areas that are home to one of the earth's finest wildlife sites. These wetlands are not hospitable for humans to live and thus make them perfect refuge for wildlife. Some of the world's most amazing animals find refuge in these wetlands right from man-eating crocodiles to air-breathing fish. What makes these marshy clearings special is that they act as meeting point for the various secretive animals living in the wetlands. The animals come out in the open together to eat wetland plants, drink and get salts from the muddy pools. Wild pigs can be seen jumping around in the mud. Forest elephants with their little ones come here to enjoy bathing in the water. Surprisingly, the families of gorillas emerge from the forest to eat, play, relax under the shining sun. Hippos and crocodiles are permanent residents of the wetlands. But more than crocodiles, lions or hyenas, the most dreaded animal of the wetland is the hippopotamus. Although these hippopotamuses eat grass for food, they can be very aggressive if someone gets too close to scare them. As soon as they feel threatened, they will suddenly charge and go the potential danger with their tusks. The social life of these hippopotamuses is very complicated. They spend their day resting in water and come on to land to eat grass only during the night. During dry seasons, herds of other species are attracted to the wetland and visit the region from far off places for many reasons. They like to cool off in the water and by coming here, they also escape their potential predators. Thus, wetlands become one of the richest wildlife regions of the planet Earth. It is also one of the most important areas for wildlife conservation on the planet. In spite of this, the wetland animals living here are faced with challenge of survival. Food and shelter are the major concerns for them and at the same time, they should also protect themselves from their predators so that they can produce their next generation of species. Just as any other biome, wetlands too have their own food chain with dead plants forming the base of the wetland food chain. Leaves and stalks falling into water ultimately decay and become food for aquatic insects and small shrimp-like animals. These in turn become food for fish, frogs and birds. Some animals of the wetlands like the moose and the capybaras eat live plants. Capybaras are found in South America and live in small herds. They are similar to giant guinea pig and have partly webbed feet. They have eyes and nose on the top of their head so that they can see and breathe while swimming in the water. Turtles are one species of animals that are omnivores. That is, they eat both plants and animals. Then there are specialized predators that haunt the wetlands and are at the top of the food chain of the wetlands. They are crocodiles and alligators. Crocodiles hide in the water and wait for an animal to come close to the water's edge to drink water. Unaware of the hiding crocodile, as the animal comes close enough, the crocodile sweeps the animal off its feet with a strong lash of its tail and snatches it in its mouth. This way in which these crocodiles hunt is known as stealth. Another strong predator of the wetland is the anaconda. It is world's heaviest snake and is found in South America. Wetlands are its favorite hideouts. It silently slips through the water in search of capybaras and caimans. As it finds its prey, it coils around the victim and suffocates it by crushing the lungs. After the victim dies, the snake swallows the whole body. This way of killing the victim for food is called constriction. It might sound impossible for the snake to swallow huge animals, but as the snake starts to swallow its victim, 
the bones of its jaw dislocate. This allows the mouth of the snake to stretch around the huge body of the prey and swallow it. For the animals of the wetland, living here is no less than an art. The land animals find it is hard to walk around the wetland without getting their feet struck in the mud. To overcome this problem, several kinds of deer have developed feet that are spread out when they put their body weight on them. Ducks and otters have webbed feet that they use for both swimming and walking in the wetlands. Jasanas are the kind of birds that have amazingly long toes that spread their weight widely. This allows them to walk over water lilies without sinking. They also use their long legs as stilts to wade through shallow water. There is one group of animals that includes frogs and salamanders that can live on both land and water. These animals are known as amphibians. The young ones of these animals, like tadpoles, live in water and breathe through gills. As they grow into an adult, they shift their base to land. But it is important for the adults to keep their skin moist. So the adults prefer damp habitats. Another major challenge the wetland animals have to face is the seasonal changes. Some of the wetlands remain flooded for half the year and then become dry for the rest half. For the birds and insects, it is easy to cope as they can fly away during hard times, but other animals have to be extra careful. The Amazon and Congo rivers flood the surrounding forest during rainy season, allowing the fish to swim through the trees. While the insects that live on ground have to migrate to the treetops in order to survive the flood. When the water level drops, the fish return to river. Lungfish of Africa, Australia and South America stay where they are even when their wetland habitats become dry. Before the water completely disappears, they dig themselves into the mud and their bodies sealed in a protective membrane with just their lips being seen. They stay where they are for months, breathing but without moving and waiting for the rains to return and fill the river. There are several species of dolphin too that live in fresh water. Amazon River is home to two of the dolphin species which are different from each other. One of the species has a close relation to the marine dolphins, while the other is a member of a unique group called the river dolphins. The Amazon River Dolphin has a long thin nose and is almost blind. It has a flexible neck and body that allows it to wade through the tangle of underwater branches when the forest is flooded. The other Amazon Dolphin is not as capable and has to stay behind in the river. Wetlands may be mesmerizing places on planet Earth, but they are also home to horrible diseases. The blood-sucking mosquitoes spread diseases like malaria and yellow fever. The disease schistosomiasis is caused by parasitic worms that have made wetland their home. The life of these worms takes shape in the bodies of snails and then leaves their host to swim freely. Paddling through the water filled with these worms is dangerous as these worms then burrow through the skin and set up their new home in the human body. This causes an itchy rash called swimmer's itch. It can also lead to more serious problems. Leeches are the other blood suckers found in tropical wetland. These leeches stick to the ankle as one wades through the water and they are capable of slipping under clothes and into shoes. These leeches stick to the ankles as one wades through the water and they are capable of slipping under clothes and into shoes. They fasten themselves into the skin of human beings using their sucker-like mouth and secrete a painkiller so they are not felt on the body. Some leeches prefer frogs and fish to suck the blood, while others like to suck blood from large animals including human beings. There are certain kinds of leeches that are used for medicinal purpose to get rid of blood that has collected in the swellings. The biggest leech in the world can be found in Amazon and it grows up to 18 inches long. A wide array of birds have also made wetlands their home. 
and if one is looking at the densest population of the birds on planet Earth, then wetland is the place to head for. Herons, storks, cranes and ibises are the large wading birds giving the wetlands a spectacular look. Ducks, geese and grebes too live in wetlands along with kingfishers, hawks, eagles and other birds. By looking at the kind of bills the birds have, we can come to know what they eat. Herons have dagger-like bills and they use it for stabbing the fish. Herons make use of their sharp eyes to spot the fish and before they can strike their target, they curve their long neck back in S shape. Of all the wetland birds, Shoebill and the whale-headed stalk of Africa have the most unusual beak. They use their gigantic bill to dig lungfish out of their burrows and also to snatch fish from the water. The shoebill bird may appear fierce in their looks, but they are quiet and patient birds. They are capable of standing for hours without any motion in their body, waiting to ambush fish and other prey. The breeding season is the best time to watch these birds. This is the time when males and females court each other. When it comes to courtship dances, cranes are a delight to watch. They leap off the ground, hop on one leg, flap their wings and make trumpeting noises. These birds prefer the wetlands because of one major benefit and that is wetlands have the advantage of being a safe haven for their little ones. Mangrove swamps have become true forests and are a unique habitat for many land-dwelling forest creatures. As we have seen in the first part, the leaves that are dropped from the trees of the mangrove play an important role in the ecology of the swamp and form the base of food chain that support animals. Two families of small crabs have specialized in living in mangrove swamps across the world in huge numbers. These are the fiddler crabs and the grapsits. During high tides, these crab dig burrows and stay inside to avoid predatory fish. As low tide comes, the fiddler crabs sift through the mud for food, while the crabs search for dead mangrove leaves which they store and eat. Both families of crabs have the capability to survive out of water for a while, but it is necessary that they return to their burrows from time to time to keep their gills moist. Male fiddler crabs have one claw bigger than the other that serves two purposes. One, it sends signal to other male crabs that they are prepared to defend their burrows. And secondly, it uses the claw to attract their mate. Mangrove swamps are also home to odd-looking frog-faced fish called the mud skipper. These mud skippers move around out of water by flicking their tails to hop along the mud and also by levering themselves along their front fins in a slow walk. To avoid larger fish, these mud skippers often climb on a mangrove root as they have the advantage of breathing through their moist skin as well as through gills. Some species of mud skipper hunt prey while others sift through mud for food. Mangroves across the world have a variety of large animals living in them. Deer, Wild pigs, tigers and rhinoceroses have made Asiatic mangrove swamps their home. Even the treetops serve as home to monkeys and colorful birds. Turtles, snakes and monitor lizards live in water here. But the most dangerous and bigger animal found in Eastern Asia and Australia is the estuarine or saltwater crocodile with 13 feet long this estuarine saltwater crocodile is the largest reptile in the world. They wait silently at water's edge for large animals to come by. And as the animal arrives to drink water, the crocodile lunges forward and grabs them, pulling them inside the water. After drowning its victim, the crocodile spins around to tear the body parts of its victim before eating it. This is the Nile Delta. It is a broad triangular plain formed where the mighty Nile River meets the Mediterranean Sea. But the delta 
stopped being a natural wilderness since a long time. The land was used by ancient Egyptians, later by the Romans to grow crops. Even today, human population of Egypt in large numbers live in the delta and along the banks of the Nile. The Nile Delta is haven for migratory birds. Every year, more than a billion birds fly from Europe and India to the Nile Delta. While some of the birds stay for winter, others use the Delta as a stopover for a long journey further south into Africa. The famous Suez Canal in the Nile Delta opened in the year 1869 and it shortened the sea route between Europe and Asia by saving thousands of kilometers of traveling. When seawater flowing along the new canal flooded a low-lying area, it formed the Great Bitter Lake. Cairo, the capital of Egypt, lies at the base of the Triangle of the Delta and has been the largest city in Africa for centuries. To the west are the pyramids at Giza that were built 4,500 years ago. Throughout the history of mankind, wetlands have played an important role in the lives of humans as well as wildlife. It is important to learn more and more about the wetlands in order to realize its importance and ensure its safety. For the hunters, wetland has been their favorite hunting ground and they have often visited these wetlands to take advantage of the abundance of fish birds and animals that habitat these wetlands. During the dry season, early cattle herders led their herds to wetland areas in search of green grass. Over the years, most of these people have developed ways of surviving here and have become wetland specialists beautifully, making maximum use of whatever the area has to offer. People in the fens of eastern England and the Netherlands developed what came to be known as wetland cultures. Hunters floated wooden ducks on the water to fool real ducks so that they came within catching range. The same trick was also used by the ancient Egyptians. While people in crafts business used reeds for making baskets, roofing material and other related items, the people used flat bottom boats to move around the shallow wetland waters, maneuvering the boats using long poles. Some 5,000 years ago, the wetlands of southern Iraq served as a home to a certain group of people called the Marsh Arabs or Madden. These people live on islands in the marshes constructed with reeds. They use the reeds to build elegant canoes and beautiful arched houses. The Marsh Arabs had a varied occupation involving hunting and fishing along with growing rice and keeping herds of water buffalo tethered to their islands. They enjoyed a unique lifestyle for many, many years. But unfortunately, this unique lifestyle is disappearing at a very fast rate. Wetlands played an important role in development of farming and people have been growing crops here around 10,000 years ago. Then they shifted to the river floodplains and farming spread and developed in ancient China and other places. Very often, farming can change a wetland to such an extent that it ceases to be a wetland. But in the case of rice, this is not correct because rice is a true wetland plant. Farmers plant it in flooded fields called paddies. These paddies are surrounded by low banks to keep the water trapped. In most of eastern and southern parts of Asia, the land is covered with paddies that form a kind of artificial wetlands. These artificial wetlands can be important habitats for frogs, snakes and migrating water birds along with other animals. These artificial wetlands have also been used by farmers to stock fish. In the past, wetlands were thought to be wastelands and unhealthy places infested with mosquitoes and leeches. So humans kept away from them. But in recent centuries, people began to destroy wetlands on a large scale for wood. They have also started using the land for shrimp farming. People have also damaged wetlands by allowing polluted water to enter them. Damaging the wetland 
not only makes the plants and animals to suffer, we humans too deprive ourselves of the benefits that wetlands provide us naturally. The major benefit being protection from floods. In the absence of wetlands, we are at a risk of catastrophic floods. Flooding of rivers is a natural process and rivers that flood regularly have wetlands surrounding them. But when we humans try to control the flood, we in turn destroy the wetlands. It is interesting to know how wetlands control floods. The wetlands have the capacity to absorb water and by absorbing water, they can stop a large flood from creating havoc. While upstream wetlands can soak up heavy rain, thus not allowing the water to enter the river. On the flood plains, wetland provides space for flood water to spill out. In a similar manner, the wetlands in the coast can protect against flooding from the sea and reduce wearing away of the land, also known as erosion. The tangled roots of mangrove trees plays an important role in controlling the flooding. These roots are good at absorbing the energy of storm waves. In the absence of these trees, the storm waves would wash ashore and do great damage. Wetlands also serve as water purifier. When water passes through a wetland, it comes out purer than before. Fertilizers mixed in water can be easily removed by the wetland plants or by the bacteria that lives amongst the roots of these trees, thus purifying the water. Some wetlands, like bogs, have the capacity to hold on to chemicals called heavy metals and thus preventing them from getting into drinking water. Due to this purifying properties of water, people have set up various systems for water purification. In many countries, sewage water is purified using bed of reeds. Another system is to use wetlands containing water hyacinth plants to purify water polluted by heavy metals. The plants absorb these toxic chemicals and are later scooped out of the wetland and thrown away. Wetlands have many more added advantages that can serve the human race across the globe. Like, by trapping heavy rains, wetlands give water time to percolate into the ground and fill up underground water stores. Peat bogs help reduce global warming by removing carbon dioxide gas from the air. Wetlands provide natural beauty to the surroundings and this natural beauty of the wetland landscapes and wildlife can be enjoyed by ecotourists, thus providing jobs to the local people and helping the local economy to flourish. For scientists, wetlands and bogs are a storehouse for historical records. By digging into them, the scientists can find the evidence of the types of earth's plants and climate that existed thousands of years ago. The world's largest river delta is formed where the Brahmaputra and Ganges rivers of Asia flow into the Bay of Bengal. The area where the delta meets the sea is a vast mangrove forest known as the Sundarbans. The Sundarbans is spread across a total area of approximately 10,000 square kilometers and is home to the largest population of tigers. The local variety of the tiger is given the name Royal Bengal Tiger. These Royal Bengal Tiger not only hunt wild boar for food but also humans. It is estimated that in the late 1970s, Tigers killed around 45 people every year in the Sundarbans. The local people going to the forest pray to their god and goddesses to protect them from the tigers. They use various devices to save themselves from the tigers. When moving through the forest, they wear human face masks behind their heads to scare off the predator. Electrified human dummies are also left behind in order to prevent the tigers from attacking humans. Other than these tigers, the other rare species of the cat family found here are fishing cats and jungle cats. Mongoose and the monkeys have also made the Sundarbans their home. The nearest major city to Sundarbans is Calcutta, now known as Kolkata. The wetlands are waterlogged and the mangrove trees grow in waterlogged mud. The roots of these trees get little air. This shortfall is compensated by 
vertical roots that work like snorkels. These roots grow upwards from the ground. The roots have small holes called lenticles, which let air enter the hollows inside the root, thus allowing the air to circulate deep underground. Even though wetlands have a life of their own, they are under threat by humans. Although many countries have realized its importance and are going all out to protect and restore them, yet the damage is continuously being done. Hunting of animals for their skin is one of the most common threat that the wetland faces. Wetlands are also continuously being drained so that they can be converted into farmlands. Sometimes it so happens that plants not belonging to the wetlands escape into it and make wetlands their home. They grow to such an extent that they start crowding the natural plant life. In order to meet the ever-increasing need for electricity and water, we have constructed huge dams which pose another threat to these wetlands. Dams built by humans serve dual purpose. They stop floods and also provide electricity through hydroelectric power station. Water trapped in the dam is allowed to flow down huge pipes, driving the turbines. And these turbines convert the energy of flowing water into electricity. Due to these hydroelectric dams, the wetlands are deprived of water, causing damage and destroying them. In some parts of the world, water is a precious resource and the countries involved can go to the extent of war to control the water of the rivers. Global warming is caused by greenhouse gases that build in the atmosphere and trap the sun's heat. Because of this, many wetlands near the coast may end up drowning under the sea. Rice paddies might be responsible for making global warming even worse. When the dead plants rot, they release methane gas, which again is a greenhouse gas. Many countries have taken the initiative and have come together to manage their wetlands. In 1971, scientists and officials from all over the world held a conference in the town of Ramsar in Iran to discuss the future of wetlands. The countries involved agreed to protect their wetlands and also encouraged others to do so. Each new country that signs up has to nominate a minimum of one wetland area that it will protect. In USA, they have developed a policy of no net loss. Under this policy, if people destroy or build on a wetland, they have to create a new one elsewhere. But one drawback of this policy is that people are not sure how to create a wetland. Some think that the best way is to flood the land and leave the rest to nature to take care. While others are of the opinion that deliberate planting helps the process along. In the year 1996, an experiment was carried out on the Colorado River. Flood water was deliberately released from a dam that resulted in recreating riverside wetlands. Ever since, natural flooding of river is being allowed to take place again on certain rivers. In due course of time, large wetlands may also be restored around the Mississippi River to help control flooding. These steps taken by human beings are a positive step towards conserving wetlands of the world. We now understand the wetlands and know how they work. We are also aware of the consequences that we will face if we try to interfere with them. Today, no developed country can build a dam without stopping to think the damage it might cause to the environment. But many people think of their present needs and do not look at the future consequences. As a result, the wetlands will always remain under pressure as humans continue their development and exploit the wetlands for their future benefit and survival. Come what may, one thing is sure. Benefits provided by the wetlands cannot be measured in money. But if the wetlands were to disappear from the face of earth, the world would surely be a poor place to live in.